All right, so good morning, everybody. I'm Bruce Black. Um, I am the horticulture educator for Carol Lee and Whiteside County, um, and we are up in Northwest Illinois. Um, for those that are joining us from around the state and from other states as well, I thank you for joining us this morning. Um, we are going to um, have everybody muted for today's presentation and I would ask that you not have your video on. Um, we do have upwards of 250 people registered for today's um, webinar presentation and if everybody is um, using their video um, it can cause some distortions or some issues for folks who might be in the country or have limited internet access. So with that, I'm going to turn off my video for the time being, just so that it creates a better presentation. But I will start my video back up um, when we do questions, and um, that way it creates more of an interaction for us. So um, We are going to get started with today's presentation, and today's presentation is on drought tolerant uh, annuals and perennials. And um, this is a presentation that I do have to give major thanks to Dr. Cynthia Haynes from Iowa State University. Um, she was my major professor in grad school, and um, she is also the consumer horticulture and annual and perennial expert at Iowa State. And so she was gracious enough to share this presentation with me. And I've put a little bit of my own spin on it. Um, so it's going to be different for those Iowa Master Gardeners who are joining us today. Um, you'll get a little bit of my flair mixed in. Um, and for those that have been with us the past couple of weeks, um, you know that my area of expertise is more um, fruits and vegetables, but um, I have branched out into um, general horticulture as well um, and look forward to sharing this presentation on flowers with you today. So the first thing I thought we would do and bear with me here. Um, I'm still learning all the intricate features of Zoom, but I thought we would try incorporating some polls and questions into today's presentation to make um, the presentation a little more interactive. So what I'm going to do is in a moment, there's going to be a question that pops up on your screen. And the question is going to be, are you currently growing flowers? And so on your screen, you should be able to select one of the five choices um, once the present or once the poll launches. And I'm going to launch that poll now. So if you guys would answer question number one for me about are you currently growing flowers? So the answers are yes annuals all the way yes perennials though yes i grow annuals and flower annuals and perennials you dig no i'm currently not a flower grower and no but i would like to so the question should pop up on your screen and you guys can answer I just have to say this is kind of fascinating. I've never done this before, but I can see the percentages popping up and I kind of feel like one of those election night um, commentators on the news where you can see poll results coming in. So um, as soon as we, um, in about another 10 seconds or so, 
we'll have the poll close and then I think I can share those results with you guys. Um, so if you want to take another couple of seconds to um, answer the first question. Bruce, some people are saying that, um, well, although others are answering for them, that they don't see the submit button. Never mind, although somebody are saying. Okay. And so if the poll pops up on your screen, uh, you have to scroll down on the question and I believe submit is at the bottom. And I know some folks are answering all three questions. Um, we will relaunch the other two questions during the presentation. Um, so, looks like we've got about 50% coming in. So, I'm going to close the poll. And we'll look at question one. Uh, you should see the results on your screen for question one of, are you currently growing flowers? And it looks like most of our folks on the call today are growing annuals and perennials. We've got a couple of folks who are doing uh, just annuals or perennials. And then we've got one person on today's call that is not growing but would like to. So I'm glad to see um, we didn't have anybody who was not currently a flower grower. Um, but hey, if you're on the call and you're not currently a flower grower, maybe by the end of the presentation today, we will get you in that flower growing boat. All right, so why did I put today's presentation together? And um, this is really one of those things where our annual rainfall tends to be iffy. In some places, um, looking at weather data, which when I updated the weather data on here, I looked all over Northwest Illinois. Um, I looked at Freeport data, um, Dixon data, Rock Falls data, Amboy data, and even just in that um, minor area, there's such a fluctuation in between uh, annual rainfall totals. Um, the further we go back for some of the data, um, back to 2013, 2014, um, these totals looked completely different. Um, so you can see in 2015 and 2016, um, we had about um, 40 um, to 50 inches of rain. Um, when we go back to 2013, 2014, we were only at about 30 inches of rain in Northwest Illinois. Um, in the last couple of years though, it seems that we've been getting more rain. Um, and so that's good to see, but not every, every year is going to be a year of rain. And so um, this data comes from the Midwestern Regional Climate Center, um, which is a great resource if you're interested in um, rainfall totals or precipitation totals. And for these totals, these are 12 month totals. Um, with the exception of 2019 data, um, there were a couple of months that are missing. So, if we know that we're not always going to have the rain that's expected, what can we do? So we can plan ahead and we can utilize rain barrels to collect water. Um, util hooking these rain barrels up to our eave spouts or on our sheds, our garages, our houses can be a way to collect water. Um, if you guys remember last week's program on community gardens, um, 
I mentioned quickly that we tried to incorporate rain barrels, just setting barrels into the outside of the garden, but we didn't have a way to collect a large amount of water, like off of a house or a roof, to funnel that into the barrel. So um, we had to get a little creative. Um, if you're not able to collect water or retain water, um, you can prevent water loss and incorporating some mulches. Mulches help hold in that moisture. And depending on the type of mulch you can you use, you can either heat up the soil to um, where you keep the heat from the sun in the soil, or you can cool the soil by using more of a organic type mulch that's going to hold that water and create a bit of a moisture barrier. There are also ways that we can help if we do containers. So this is one of those products that I love just from a science perspective. Um, these water absorbing crystals, um, they're some of the same crystals that are in certain types of diapers. Um, so if you've ever had one of these rip or you found these, um, they're like plastic and they hold water and they expand when they get wet. And so we can utilize these in our containers to help hold the moisture in those containers. If you are going to put those in containers, it is a great, great important tip to moisten those before you put them into the soil. Um, I've had people that have utilized these crystals and they've put them in their um, pots dry and then put the soil back on top and they were going out of town so they heavily watered the plant before they left. They came back to the plant out of the container onto the floor. So when those crystals expanded, they actually pushed the pot or pushed the plant out of the pot. So moisten those a little bit before you put them into the soil uh, as a great way to help. You can also incorporate mulch into your containers, putting that on top, as well as utilizing the shade of your environment. So putting those containers either in the shadow of a building or you can put up shade cloth over an area of your garden to help protect from the sun. So we're going to start our um, drought tolerant presentation with our perennials. Um, these are going to be perennials that are selected that do well in the Midwest. So they um, were selected for their bloom times, their growth habits, their cold hardiness, um, as well as their um, ability to stand up to either a dry soil or a, um, well, I like to call it the brown zone of um, soils, the heavy clay soils where you can't grow anything. Some of these plants can be planted there and thrive well. So the first six plants that were, well, seven plants we're going to talk about are butterfly weed, which is this one, our feather reed grass here in the middle, sneeze weed, Russian sage, sedum, blanket flower, and lamb's ear. So we're going to talk about all of these as we go on in the next few slides. And there's one thing I wanted to tell you before we get started with these. 
we have a lot of plans in today's presentation. Um, we're not going to touch on all of them, but I wanted to give you those as recommendations for um, what you can plant in your yard. So starting off with our blanket flower, and um, this is a summer blooming perennial, and it has daisy-like red, yellow, and orange flowers. Um, I, I joke with people, this is the Iowa State flower, um, as in the university, but it's, it's officially not, um, just because cardinal gold is the Iowa State colors. Um, what's really great about this, and one thing that I love about this flower, is the gray-green hairy tooth foliage. So even when those flowers aren't in bloom, you've got a wonderful almost grayish green silver foliage that's in your yard. It is hardy to our area and um, these only get about two to three feet tall and only have a spread of about two feet. Um, one great note about these is to deadhead them to prolong their bloom. Um, so as the season goes on and these flowers get spent, you can pick them off, but you'll wanna stop um, deadheading them in late August. These will uh, tolerate a wet winter soil and um, they are heat and drought tolerant. Sometimes these uh, plants can get a little bit floppy. Um, so if you have an area where there, there's a wind blowing through, these can get a little floppy. Um, for this, there are no serious disease or insect problems. And that's what the DI on the slide stands for. And um, it occasionally can have some powdery mildew problems, but not serious. Um, our next flower is the butterfly weed. And so this is Asclepius tuberosa, and it's another summer blooming perennial. This one, again, gets about two feet to three feet tall and two feet wide. And this, as the name suggests, is a butterfly magnet. Um, the small orange and yellow flowers are um, heavily attractive to butterflies. Um, again, has the hairy, hairy leaves and um, cold hardy for our um, area. Um, this is a plant that loves full sun, so it's best not to put this in um, a partial shade environment. One thing to note about this plant though is it hates wet feet. So putting it in an area where um, it, the landscape either ponds or puts, has some drainage issues where the water stands, this plant is going to have more of a tendency to rot. Um, these can be late to emerge in the summer and due to it having a taproot, it is one that's hard to transplant. Um, there are no serious problems with this, but aphids can be an issue. So if you live in the country and there are some soybean fields around, you might notice an increase in um, aphids present. This also is a native to North, or native to Eastern North America. And we will have a section today on native plants. So these are going to be um, Midwestern natives. Um, but for those that know me, 
I do like to throw some Iowa in there, so we will have more Iowa native plants, but those are going to be adapted for our area as well. Feather reed grass, um, this is an early summer blooming um, grass. And this one does get about three to four feet tall and three feet wide. And it has these long, narrow panicles that you can see on top. Um, and the panicles start off as a green color. They fade to pink. And then as the growing season continues on, they turn into this golden tan color that you see on the screen. Um, the panicles are about 15 inches long, so it is about a third to half the height. Um, again, no serious disease problems with this one. Um, this is a grass that does particularly well if you have a heavy clay soil. Um, it can also be considered a cool season grass, but is very heat tolerant. Lamb's ear. This is a summer perennial ground cover, and this one gets about 12 to 15 inches tall and has a 12 inch spread. Um, this is one of those plants that I really like for a children's garden because of the pubescence or the hair that is on this plant. Uh, it's very soft. Um, it, because of the shape um, and that hairiness, it does look exactly like a lamb's ear. And so it has purple pink flowers um, that you can see on these spikes. And the silver white um, hairs are on square stems. And so I think even though we're doing this distance, I heard a few of our um, gardeners on the, on the line shiver um, with square stems. Um, because square stems do indicate a member of the mint family. Um, this one doesn't have, um, insect issues, but when we have hot, humid weather, like we had last year, you can have fungal issues present on um, the plant. Um, one thing that is great about this plant, um, people tend to think of these uh, flower spikes as a secondary thought. Um, it's mostly grown for the foliage. And so if you don't really like the pink purple flower spikes, you can simply remove those when they start developing and keep that energy into the leaves and keep it more as a foliage plant. And um, there are some cultivars available that you can get for lamb's ear that don't have any flowers. Um, so silver carpet is a cultivar that has silver foliage that does spread rapidly. So it grows more outward rather than developing those flowers. Russian sage. And um, this is one that is not only beautiful um, for a late summer fall blooming um, perennial, but it's fun to say. So a lot of folks um, kind of stay away from the scientific names. Um, they do have great place um, when identifying plants across regions or across countries. Um, so this Russian sage 
I, I have to say the scientific name because it's Perovskia a triplicifolia. And that is just a fun scientific name to say. Um, and so this one was actually named after a Russian general. And this flower is beautiful. Um, this is one that I see when I walk along the river area in Dixon. Um, it's small world lavender blue flowers um, on a gray white leaf. And so it's recognizable. Um, it gets three to four feet tall. It gets three to four feet wide and it, it develops it looks like a bush or a shrub when it's in full bloom and at maturity. Um, this is also one that in the late summer, fall, I see covered in pollinators. So this is another good one for pollinators. Um, it's also one of those aromatic plants as it is a member of the sage family. So it has that wonderful smell with it. Um, I know some people tend to stay away from this because it can be a big, um, um, plant getting four foot by four foot. Um, but there is a cultivar named Little Spire, which is a dwarf variety. So it cuts down on the size, but still has all those great features of Russian sage. The other, um, plant in this picture is sedum, um, which is showy stone crop. Um, and I love the combination of sedum with Russian sage. Um, for those that haven't grown uh, sedum before, it's more of a fall blooming perennial and it gets small white, pink, and yellow, white, pink, and red flowers, excuse me, and it only gets 18 to 24 inches tall. And you can see here in the picture, this, it looks like it's a flat um, mass of the sedum, but it is actually having a rounded habit. So it gets to a point, but then the plant fills in and has that rounded um, shape to it. Um, just like other sedums, it does have those dark, succulent, fleshy leaves that we know with a lot of the indoor succulents that we grow. This will tolerate a dry soil. Being in the sedum family, it is um, an adapted, um, a plant that's adapted to a more arid or dry environment. Um, and, big bonus for me that I love about this plant is that the dried flower heads stand all winter long. So I, in the new house I bought, has have sedum all around the house and all winter I left those up and just recently in the last couple of weeks have cut those sedum heads down because they were a nice accent to the landscape even when um, we had snow, it was nice to see some kind of plant vegetation up. Sneezeweed. Um, so sneezeweed is one of those plants that gets a bad reputation. So sneezeweed is a fall, late summer fall blooming plant that has yellow daisy like or red orange flowers. And the reason why this one gets a bad reputation is because it has the same bloom time as ragweed. And so people think just because it has the name of sneezeweed and it blooms at the same time ragweed does, it's the cause of seasonal allergies. 
but it's it's actually the other way around. Ragweed is the one that makes people sneeze, and sneezeweed has little effect on that. This is a native to North America. Um, this one is one of those plants that you don't want to fertilize because it tends to grow straight up and you get more spindly growth associated with that. Um, you want to cut this plant back in early to mid July to encourage better flowers. Um, when this one gets tall, because it does get three to six feet tall um, and three feet wide, um, this is one that may require some staking. Now, for the native section, these are gonna be our Iowa natives. And these are ones that I grew up seeing a lot. Um, so we've got Rattlesnake Master up here at the top. We've got our Asters down, er, nope, we've got our Asters here in the middle, and then we've got our Baltonias on the bottom right. Some other plants that we're going to talk about in this section is going to be the cone flowers here in the middle, the goldenrod down at the bottom right, false indigo, and coreopsis down in the bottom right. And so we're going to start off with the aster. And so this one is a plant that does have some issues associated with it but it's one of those beautiful late summer fall blooming perennials that have those daisy-like flowers as you can see in either purple, pink, or white. Um, this is a plant that even though it does have some of those disease issues, we can do our best by um, providing a good air circulation environment, to cut down on some of the powdery mildew issues that we have. And it really does accent a garden. Um, my favorite thing, even though it's one of the issues, is the dark green pubescence on the leaves. Um, the leaves are how the powdery mildew sets in and the powdery mildew kills off the leaves. Um, but the purple on green is a great accent. Depending on the cultivar that you put in for an aster, um, they're going to get about three to five feet tall. Um, the flowers that I mentioned, they're going to be about two inches across in diameter. Um, and this is one that does do well um, with some either pinching or stalking for some of the staking for some of those taller cultivars. Um, this is also one that grows rapidly. So this one is a candidate for um, frequent division. So that's where you dig the plant up, you divide it, and then put it into multiple areas of your yard. Baltonia um, is our next one that we've got here. And again, another fall blooming perennial. Um, and this one gets about three to six feet tall and three to four feet wide. Daisy-like flowers again, but these occur in white. Um, they have a grayish green foliage that you can see here in the picture um, as well. But these leaves, instead of being pubescent or hairy like some of the last ones have been, these are going to be more of a glossy. So they look like they've got a shininess to them. 
Um, they do tolerate a clay soil. So this is one that um, if you have a place in your yard that will grow nothing, plant Baltonia. It is quick to establish, but it is also hard to kill. Um, very few problems, but it does have some issues with um, powdery mildew. And if you're looking for a shorter cultivar, um, there's one that's called Snowbank that only gets about three feet tall. Um, it's self-supporting, has a more compact habit, um, if that's something that's preferred. Coneflower is going to be our next um, perennial that we've got. And for this one, this one is a summer blooming perennial. And they get about, depending on the cultivar, between two feet tall and four feet tall, um, and about two feet wide. And this one does have a more erect growth habit, so it grows straight up. Um, and this comes in a wide array of, um, colors. So pinks, purples, reds, yellows, greens, whites, um, the peach cultivars, um, also look amazing. Um, one unique thing about the cone flower is that the petals actually droop down. So in some of the other um, flowers that we've had, they grow out or they grow up. These actually droop down. These are drought and heat tolerant. Um, they will tolerate some light shade and they'll actually do a little bit better in a light shade and the only reason that they do a little bit better is you can see in the one in the screen that the petal colors have kind of sun bleached a little bit um, if you want to have a more intensified color that light shade will help bring that color in more they are short-lived so they're only up for a couple of weeks um, but deadheading them does encourage rebloom. Um, they also do have disease and insect issues with them. Um, the disease aster yellows, Japanese beetles love them. Um, rabbits love them as well. Um, they do have some issues with leaf spot, um, but this can also be one of those good plants that you plant for the birds. So um, goldfinches will love visiting these coneflowers to eat the seeds. So if you're a bird lover, great plant for gardening. Um, tick seed. Tick seed is a early summer fall blooming plant. Um, and depending on the variety of Coreopsis you get, there's the um, Threadleaf Coreopsis, which is pictured on the screen. But then there's also the Coreopsis grandifolia, which is the tick seed. It common name is tick seed. Um, both of them have a habit of about two feet tall. But the threadleaf uh, coreopsis does have a wider habit. As you can see in the picture, it gets about two to three feet wide versus the tick seed, which only gets one foot wide. Um, the 
threadleaf coreopsis does do well in a dry, full sun environment. Um, you want to remove the spent blooms and deadhead to um, encourage continued flowering. And these have very few um, issues with them, but it's always a good thing to note that these have a habit that they could spread a little bit outside that three foot margin. This is also one of those plants that has a, a, a unique um, type of leaf. It has a palmate type leaf. So um, think of the palmate leaves, very similar here, but they're in a very small format. Goldenrod is our next one, which is a midsummer uh, fall blooming perennial. And this one, depending on the cultivar, um, will either get four to seven feet tall, or if you get the hybrid um, that's a dwarfing hybrid, it's only going to get about two to three feet tall. Both um, types of goldenrod do get about 18 inches wide. And they have these small yellow flowers, um, which you can see on the screen there, um, that are only about an eighth of an inch long and they're arranged in long panicles. So when you see the goldenrod, those are actually little tiny flowers on these panicles, very similar to um the grass that we talked the feather reed grass that we talked about a moment ago um this is a plant that does need good air circulation um so this is one to either put on the edge of a garden bed or one where it's surrounded by small plants um, just to help cut down on some of the rust issues that it can have um, this is also one that it does not need any fertilization because it will have abundant growth just with the nutrients that are in the soil. And again, this is a perennial that gets a bad rap. Um, goldenrod does not cause hay fever. Ragweed is to blame. So another one of those plants that gets a bad rap just because it's in the same bloom time as ragweed. False indigo. Um, this one is a spring blooming perennial that gets three to four feet wide and um, or three to four feet tall and four feet wide. Um, Mostly grown for these indigo blue um, butterfly shaped flowers. And the foliage is beautiful on these. It's a blue green pea like foliage. So very similar to if you grew peas in your garden, um, that type of foliage. foliage. Um, plants. So this one, if you put into a shadier environment, this one is going to be need to be staked. Um, because this is one of those perennials that has a long taproot, this is one that you put it in the place when you plant it and you have to leave it. Um, it takes up to five years to establish because that taproot really needs to develop. And people always ask, can I transplant this? And this is one of those plants that if you move it, there is a high, high likelihood that it will not recover from the transplant shock. So this is one of those beautiful beautiful plants to put in your yard, but you have to make the amazing choice of where am I going to put it for the rest of the 
rest of its life. Um, fun fact, this is actually one of the um, first subsidized plants in America by the English and um, false indigo was used as a substitute for true indigo that came from the West Indies. So this was America's first subsidized crop. And it is a native to the Eastern United States. Rattlesnake Master, um, this is probably one of my favorite perennials just because it's so unique. Um, it is a summer blooming perennial that gets between three and five feet tall and two to three feet wide. Um, it's creamy greenish foliage with well, creamy greenish flowers, which are spiny. So you can see up on top of um, the picture here, these are button-like flowers, but they have little spikes on them. Um, and they're just an unusual look for um, people's gardens. Um, this is also one that looks great in a cut flower arrangement and it has gray green narrow foliage which towards the bottom of the flower you can see a little bit better um, this is drought tolerant once it is established and will tolerate infertile soils so if you have a soil that does not hold its fertilizer or nutrients, this is one that will do well there. Um, native to the United States as well as parts of Iowa. And the reason why it got its name as Rattlesnake Master is because it was once thought to cure rattlesnake bites or keep snakes away. So just a fun piece of trivia there. Sedums um, or succulents, this is our next category of drought tolerant annuals and perennials that we can have here. Um, these are hardy across most of the United States. Um, all will root or all will develop root rot in a wet environment. So we'll start off with cacti here. And these are summer flowering. They're orange, red, purple, or white flowers against the oval shaped pads. Um, they are drought tolerant as well as salt tolerant. And their only issue is that root rot um, if they're in a wet location. Hens and chicks, um, these are succulent clumps. Um, they have a varying color of foliage, and so there are greenhouses that you can find online that grow strictly succulents, and the wide range of foliage that you can get with these is amazing. Um, they have different textures associated with them. They can be velvety, they can be woolly, they can be tufted, um, they can be rough. Um, so how they get their names is the mature plant, which you can see here, top left center, is called the hen. And then the offsprings, which grow out of it, are called the chicks. All right. Um, we'll talk about ornamental grasses and then I think that's probably all we're gonna have time to go through for today, um, cause we're getting close to time. But before we end, I'll talk quickly about some of the annuals that we've got. Um, and as I mentioned with the presentation, 
a lot of plants here. I wanted to give you more than we would be able to cover um, just because it's a great, great um, topic to have. So um, starting off our ornamental grasses, we've got hardy pompous grass. And this is one that I tend to see everywhere. Uh, late summer bloom, picked because of the silver gray fluffy plumes that are um, developing out of the coarse pubescent um, green V-shaped foliage that we've got. Um, they won't tolerate a wet soil. Um, they do get very large. So at their maximum height, they will get 14 feet tall by six feet wide. And so that's one reason why these are put in um, areas that have large space. Miscanthus, um, also known as um, maiden grass, um, Japanese silver grass or zebra grass, all of these are different types of miscanthus. Um, they don't have any serious disease issues associated with them. The thing that they um, do have a associated with them is they tend to get floppy. Um, if you're planting zebra grass, that is one that's going to be mildly hardy as compared to the other two. Um, the Japanese silver grass is going to be the hardiest of the three. Um, but people tend to choose the maiden grass because it keeps its um, flower heads throughout the winter. So it's a nice fall or, or nice winter landscape feature to see those. Northern sea oats. Um, this is one I don't see too often, but it's one that I I like to see when I see it. Um, it's a late summer blooming perennial or perennial grass that gets about 36 inches tall and 18 inches wide. It can take part shade, but one of the reasons it's not planted is it can be an aggressive spreader. Um, but one of the reasons I love it is if you're looking at the picture here, these drooping clusters of flattened spikes are beautiful to see in the landscape. So they start off as dark green during the growing season. And then by the time you get to fall and winter, they've turned into this reddish bronze color. Um, it does, spread by seeds and by runners. So this is one that um, you have to put in a protected environment or in an area where you don't mind if it takes over. Um, we have a section on here as well on gray foliage plants. And this includes um, Artemisia, which is wormwood, um, snow in summer, yarrow, and lavender. And so quickly going over these, um, wormwood is one that is grown for these silver green velvet leaves. It is rust susceptible, but it tends to melt out in the summer. So when it gets really hot, it tends to fade out. Um, it often has a mounding habit at the center of it, um, but is one of those beautiful silver green plants you can have. Um, lavender is another silver green uh, foliage that we've got. Um, purple aromatic spikes on top, gets about three feet tall by three feet wide. 
this one this plant will suffer in poorly drained soils um, and it's one of those plants that doesn't have the full hardiness so in the midwest it is mildly hardy in our northern climate snow in summer uh, so this is a ground cover um, that only gets about eight inches tall and 12 inches wide um, and it is it literally makes your yard or part of your landscape look like it has um, snow cover on it because of these beautiful white flowers um, it is not heat tolerant so it does not like the heat um, it appears in late spring and once it is done flowering you should trim it back um, this is one that is does well in rock gardens close to walls um, one of those good edging plants um, yarrow this is one that's very common um, usually see the fern leaf fern leaf types like in the picture um, of a late spring summer bloomer gets four feet tall three feet wide this one is one that is good for deadheading to encourage repeat flowers as well as um, dividing it every three to four years because it is a rapid grower um, do not over fertilize this plant because it gets even leggier so it gets tall spindly and will flop easier um, there is a cultivar called moonshine which has a lemon yellow flower versus the yellow flower here um and i know we're getting short on time so i just want to mention the drought tolerant annuals that we have um moss rose um, bunny tails melon podium spider flower um, zinnia and then our calibracoa as well as the amaranth california poppy gazania lantana and the vinca the flowering tobacco which is the bottom right one here um, you may also find it as nicotiana when you look at the garden center um, celosia down here on the bottom left um, this is the spike variety, but there's also the um, brain type. And then we've got globe amaranth up here in the top. And so um, let's go ahead and try the poll one last time, just so that we can get those other two questions answered. So I'm gonna relaunch the poll and have you guys go ahead and select the options from the poll and as you're going through the annual present the annual plants that um, I didn't get to if you guys have any questions on them or um, if you want any specific information about those, please feel free to contact me. Um, my contact information is the last slide, um, on the last slide of the presentation, and happy to help out with those. Um, and I've noticed that Janice has been putting the evaluation information um, into the box. So for our um, teachers on that need CEUs, um, go to the box link 
to get that evaluation. Um, send that back to Janice or myself with your name and your IEN number on there. And once we've got your evaluation back, we'll send you your certificate of attendance. Um, for our Master Gardener and um, Master Naturalist volunteers, you would just log those hours as um, you would with any other hours in this system. And Bruce, this is Janice. We have lots of questions in the chat box. Okay. So when you're ready for those, I'm ready to start asking them. <laughs> okay, I will do my best um, with those. Um, and I know some folks do have to drop off. So what we can do is I will copy the entire chat box and over the next day or so, I'll go through, put together a frequently asked question sheet for the questions if we don't get to them, and I'll make sure to send that out to everybody. So I think we can 